morning, everyone. We also had uh, Professor Mariana Françoso, but unfortunately she couldn't come today. At this very moment, she's probably on a flight uh, to Brazil. Uh, for the ones who were here before, when Claire Smith questioned me, and uh, well, we're both Brazilians. Uh, I'm not from archaeology. I come from museum studies, and we have kind of an interdisciplinary approach uh, on colonial figures, colonial legacy, and archaeological findings. Uh, very much to the sir there who uh, posed the question on uh, colonial buildings and the assessment of this. We will try and make this um, analysis into archite arch architectural um, colonial legacies in the Netherlands versus uh, the archaeological uh, legacy in Brazil. So basically, uh, what is the background of this story? The background of this story is uh, the 20 years the Dutch have uh, occupied Brazil from uh, 1624 to 1654, uh, 30 years. And during this period, uh, the Dutch uh, assessed this man to be the governor of the colony for seven years. And he was Johann Mauritz uh, van Asselzegen. And he was a uh, German at birth, but he was very much there from a noble family uh, of Nassau Orange, and he was the representative of the Dutch in Brazil in the occupied area. Uh, so what's the background of this? Basically, uh, there is a museum in the Netherlands that's called the Mauritz House in The Hague, and uh, they had this replica of a sculpture of Johan Mauritz that was in their lobby. And in the beginning of this year, uh, he, the, museum was, the museum removed the sculpture from the lobby without making a PR or anything. And uh, some journalists saw that and accused the museum of trying to erase history by taking out this colonial figure of this plate. Uh, the thing very easily escalated up to the prime minister came on Twitter uh, to say, here you can see his quote uh, in Dutch, something like that, we should not look uh, at the present uh, or at the past with the eyes of the present to assess history. Well, that's very much of a contested sentence because if we don't do that, then what do we do? Uh, in my case, as historians or in the archaeological field. But the thing went to a complete whole level that it took like, uh, media and norm, uh, current newspapers, here you can see kind of the sculpture with a head, uh, well, beheaded, uh, and <coughs> they were uh, uh, kind of accusing the museum of a new iconoclasm, so to say. But what is this very interesting for uh, the discussion? The fact is that the Mauritz house was the house built by Johann Mauritz while he was in Brazil. And he used to send Brazilian wood and all the financing for the house from when he was being a governor. So the museum was nicknamed at the time as the Sugar Palace because, uh, of course, as probably you might know, that was basically how the colony worked at the time with uh, sugar plantations and uh, slaves, uh, slave labor. But the thing is, the house was built by, the, by Johan Mauritz, but the collection is part of the royal collection of the Netherlands. And in the building is where you can see this famous painting, The Girl with the Pearl Earring. So the museum has a royal collection, but it has this colonial uh, legacy in it, in a name, in the building, but also in a few artworks that they managed to acquire throughout uh, the last century. For example, here you can see a room they kind of arranged dedicated to Johan Mauritz and the Brazilian uh, legacy. You can see two paintings, the large two paintings are by Franz Post and the small turtles are attributed to Albert Eckhout. And here you can see a very little sculpture made of terracotta by Johan Mauritz himself. And that was the reason why uh, they decided to remove the replica from the foyer. According to them, that was made of plastic, so it had no 
um, real element key to the collection and it could cause confusion uh, to the visitors who could uh, think that the collection of the museum was from Johann Mauritz. Okay, so I mean, um, so in the end, um, let me just come here, thank you, yes. And then um, in, in um, the newsroom director, Emil Gordendecker, said, well, in Brazil, Johann Mauritz is seen as a hero, which is also the same argument used by the prime minister. So here, let's discuss a little, just how is your, um, Mauritz van Siegen noticed in, um, in perceived in Brazil? So in Brazil, interpretations of Dutch colonial Brazil and of Johann Mauritz's role have at times romantically <laughs> viewed his action as expressions of an illum illuminated mind, a humanist of the 16th century who brought benefits to the population of Dutch Brazil, highlighting the environment of religious tolerance existent under his rule in which Catholic, Protestant, as well as Jewish families cohabited the same city. More often, though, interpretations part from more critical perspectives, and they stress the political strategic nat nature of these actions and how they did not benefit the whole population, they benefit specific social groups in a society that was marked by the violence of slave and slave labor, of course. And, um, but the public figure of Johan, Johan Maritz is more well-known in Brazil than in the Netherlands, probably. And the period of colonial Dutch Brazil is part of the history content studied in school, not only in the, not only in the region occupied, but in the country as a whole. And knowledge of Dutch Brazil varies from region to region, but there's a common sense that this period existed in colonial Brazil. But I think of special interest to us, this common sense recognition of the existence of Dutch Brazil is less characterized by a shared interest on related historical events, but especially by speculations of what might have become of Brazil had the Dutch won the dispute. And the common imaginary of the history of Dutch Brazil is, to the average Brazilian, a history of the possibilities of a successful Dutch colonization. This realm of imagined possibilities is mainly of positive scenarios. Spe speculations circle around the idea that had the Dutch occupation prevailed over the Portuguese, Brazil would have turned out better in the end. <laughs> yeah. Knowledge regarding Johann Madrid's governance of Dutch Brazil may be an important factor in this co construction, because when it is thought that his administration was characterized by these improvements, investments in infrastructure, which improved the lives of the local population, it's easy to extrapolate that notion and believe that had the Dutch conquered Brazil, these improvements would have sprawled throughout the country, right? But um, the, the nostalgic view of Dutch colonialism might have another source, one that sur surpasses the actions of Johann Mauritz and is deeply embedded in Brazilian history. Well, as I think we all know, Brazil was founded on slave labor. It's a, it was the last country to abolish slavery, and currently it holds the sad title of top nation which murders its black citizens. So in a country in which racism is embedded into the very fabric of society, a sense of whiteness becomes a relevant factor for interpretation. And this can actually be seen by the, seen by the fact that speculations on the future of Dutch Brazil, they're frequently supported with the argument that we would have more white people with blonde hair and blue eyes, as if that would be a very positive and fundamental attribute. Mm -hmm. As stated, nostalgia of Dutch Brazil has one of inspiration the urbanization developed in what is today the cities of Recife and Olinda, which is in the northeast of Brazil. And one example is the bridge which connected the port, which the, from the, the port to Mauri City, which here, let's go, let's go back here in the last one. So this is the city that he built, Maris Nassau built, Maristad, and this is the bridge which he also built so that he could have access from the former city, or from the city which already <coughs> existed to his place. And I think that maybe you could say a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the history of this bridge is very much interesting. Uh, as you can see on the top uh, picture there, this is an image of today with a sign saying that the, still today it's called the Bridge Nassau, Mauricio de Nassau, Johan Mauritz. And uh, basically he built us uh, through the end of uh, his governorship. And to finish it up, uh, the WIC, which was the Dutch company he worked for during the occupation, was uh, facing uh, almost bankruptcy and he was uh, almost not finishing the bridge. So he managed to get local support and local money to finish the, the building of the bridge. And um, what happened was that he promised to these people that the crossing of the bridge would be uh, free. But in the end, he had to charge for it because otherwise he would not have enough money to pay his debtors. And what he invented was that throughout the city, he told the idea that he would make a cow fly over the bridge. <laughs> so basically he arranged with one of the local farmers at the time uh, they had a real cow put up in a higher place on display and they had a dead cow stuffed 
so they showed up the real cow over there and they put the stuffed cow into ropes uh, on both of the porters of the bridge and they did make the cow fly over the bridge. The people were amazed with all this and they started doing the crossing. By the end of the day, with all the crossing of the, the, the cow, uh, the company amassed 1,800 florins. So, uh, and this is part of the imaginary and the memory uh, that's still very much alive in Brazil. That is a picture of an event that happened this year, which you can see a cow made of uh, fabric flying over a specific place in the very city where uh, Johann Mauritz was. So, um, so a lot of these, like such as the bridge was reformed and um, Johann Mauritz house no longer exists, but we do have still um, archeological, we have architectonical structures and archeology span has dealt with them, but how has archeology span dealt with them? So archeology span may have an important role in deepening discussions on the role of Dutch colonization in Brazil an excavation of certain architectonic structures, such as a Cabal Zur Israel, the oldest synagogue in the Americas, point to the famous idea of religious tolerance by the Dutch in their colony in Brazil. But at the same time, you have excavation on the Jesuitic church, Nossa Senhora das Graças, which you have evidence of sacred statues which were vandalized and decapitated when the Dutch invasion looted and later burned the church. So it demonstrates, archaeology demonstrates, it has two aspects that such traditional notion of religious tolerance, it must be interpreted in a critical form. Besides religious buildings, archaeological structure of Dutch Brazil has dealt, um, but for, yeah, archaeological structure of Dutch Brazil has dealt frequently with forts and other military structures, such as the Fort Broom and the Fort Orange, which you can see in this photo. Both forts are popular tourist destinations, drawing visitors to archaeological excavations yes, in 2020. No, I, I would like just to stress mm -hmm. out here, for example, that this fort uh, is uh, Santa Maria. It's called Santa Maria, which is a, mm -hmm. a very Portuguese name after the Dutch being defeated, but in the social imaginary is still known as Fort Orange. That's why you can see mm -hmm. the heading there as Fort Orange. So Fort Orange or Santa Maria was subject to archaeological excavation in 2002 and 2003. And in 2003, the royal family, an official visit to Brazil, the Dutch royal family visited the fort, which, mo which shows its political <clears throat> aspect. And, um, and, but archaeological studies of Dutch Brazil forts have discussed both architectonic traits as well as artifacts found in excavations, but they generally focus on questions such as defining the structures using excavation alongside documents, attempting to understand the various layers of Dutch and Portuguese and what is each part, and recommending possible actions regarding the preservation and musealization of these architectonic structures. Unfortunately, discussions on the role of African and Native individuals regarding these spaces are practically non-existent. At most, they say, ah, 50 slaves were used as labor for such, but not even that. Usually they don't, and if they do, there's no critical aspect to it. But even though these populations certainly played a fundamental role in this space, and I'm saying not only as labor force and supplier of the material, but also as agents, as social agents in these spaces, you know, after they were constructed. Other buildings related to Dutch occupation no longer exist such as the Palace of Freiburg and its surroundings, built by Johann Maritz, and which housed the first astronomical observatory, observ observatory sorry, of the Southern Hemisphere, and the Zoo Botanical Garden, in which many new world species of plants and animals were studied. First observatories, first Zoo Botanical Gardens, first large-scale bridges, and this is just summing. The many pioneering architectural feats conducted under his, his administration serve as continuous fuel for, fuel for the Dutch nostalgic myth of Brazil at the same time reducing the credited role of other individuals and groups, such as African and Native populations, in the context of colonial Dutch Brazil. An important step in the re recognition of ignored segment lies, therefore, in the recognition of these building and historic ruins as colonial heritage. And you have to keep in mind the serious implication that the word colonial means, not just referring to a time period, but to a whole structure or organization. And just summing up, archaeologists may have a fundamental role in this question, demonstrating through materiality what ideological constructs and historical documents have traditionally ignored that indigenous and African individuals in a context of violence exerted agency in numerous ways, some of which can still be seen in the same buildings. By playing such a role, archaeology will not only bring new and exciting information about the past, but will also be able to better contribute to issues of relevance to current populations who are directly or indirectly inherited and descendants of individuals and groups who, although systematically reduced from minor role in traditional historical interpretations of Dutch Brazil, are in fact the soul and cement who built these architectural fixtures. That's it. Yeah. Yes, and I'm... No, yeah, well, I was just going to say to uh, try and connect this. How can we work with archaeology and topics such as memory studies 
or colonial legacy in museum studies to better assess this uh, imaginary of uh, creating identities in different spaces, in different places, such as uh, the, the colonizers, as we can see here with the Maurits House plan, but also in the colonized places such as Brazil and, as Eduardo say, said, more broadly in Latin America, so to say. That's it.